Amen. 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 You know, we're so blessed for the, our teachers and the kids' ministries. And, uh, and uh, one thing that I appreciate is uh, just their, their dedication and faithfulness. You know, Lenore, she hasn't been in a service for who knows how long because she loves our kids so much, you know? Amen. Amen. And we've got two teachers, Danielle and Miss Maria. Being pregnant does not stop these two. <laughs> you know, and, and they're just they're just so passionate about making sure that our kids receive and um, are, are ministered to, and uh, and uh, and you know what? And they're we're just going to keep on moving forward, and they're just so they're such a blessing to us. So thank you, Maria. Thank you, Danielle, for all that you do for our kids here. And you know, there's opportunity here for you to get involved in teaching our kids. You know, and um, we want we want to see Miss Lenore to be able to come into service once in a while, and we want to be able to give these two ladies a, a little bit of a reprieve during their when they have um, babies. You know, but they're still. They're, they're not asking for it, but I'm just I'm seeing the need here. So you have a child that's in the nursery or in the kids' church. We'd like you to get involved. We believe that um, if, you're, if you're here, that you have a place to get involved and a responsibility to as we, um, we want to grow the, grow the ministries of this church for the children, okay? So be praying for more leaders, more workers, you know? So God is good. Yes, talk to Danielle about it. So there's lots of opportunity here. It's a blessing to be able to pour into these kids' lives. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the kids at Church 180. We thank you, Lord, that we get to invest in their lives and be a part of the spiritual development, Lord, and come alongside of parents who at home are developing them and being, and ministering the word into their lives. And I thank you, Lord, we're able to reinforce those things. And Father, as they come together, as they build relationships, as they, as they, as they have, do their lessons and they do fun activities, Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that you reveal yourself to them, that today, Lord, that somebody would come to know Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the work that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Be careful as you walk downstairs. Amen. just want to give you a testimony about Kids Church a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago. There are several kids downstairs who gave their lives to Christ. And last week, we had one more individual little guy give his life to Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 That is not less important than what goes on in here. <laughs> did, I just, did I just, like, blow some people out of the water here? <laughs> What's going on down that classroom is equally as important as what is going on here, if not more important. There's lives right there that are being changed. That they're, 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 the foundation is being laid for them to walk either either walk in the walk into the relationship with Jesus or not. You know, there's there's it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a life and death situation. We believe it is because it's like we're offering them life. And it's a tremendous opportunity for us to be involved and being part of what God is doing there. We'd love to see this church just filled with kids every single Sunday. And we're just praying for God, the, the God of the harvest, to send laborers into his kingdom. Amen. Amen. And we have a passion for reaching our kids and Danielle and Lenore, Miss Lenore and Maria and uh, those who work in the nursery just have a passion to to love these kids and see them grow up in the, the faith, you know, and uh, even in the nursery, you know, the nursery is not just a place for babysitting. We just, it's a place where they can experience the love of Jesus, a place where they can come feel loved and, and experience love, you know, and uh, we just want to be a place. If, if somebody can't, the, the families here, they're experiencing love at home. I know that. But there's some families that, that, that may walk through these doors someday, and the only place where they feel it warm and accepted is here at Church 180. We want every kid to feel special. We want every kid to feel loved. We want, to, we want every kid to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and be able to impart into them um, the, the message of the gospel. But um, that's enough of your pastor's heart here today. But I'd like you to catch that vision for the children. I'd like you to catch that vision for the children. We often forget about, we think it's all about what's going up, on up here in the sanctuary. But what's going on down there is life-changing. And it's so, so incredibly important. Amen, 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 amen. Wow, God's presence in this place today, amen? Amen, amen. So thankful for God meeting us here in this place, and, you know, we just, like,
keep on keep on going back to it. But our 21 days of prayer and fasting was just a uh, just a powerful time that um, that man we just we've just seen an increase of God's presence and power in um, in the in this church and people's lives. We've seen God do amazing, amazing, amazing things. We've had awesome testimonies of of not only um, God's miraculous power through physical healing, but also um, supernatural provision that's happening in people's lives. We're seeing God move and do great things, you know, and uh, it's just been great to hear the testimonies of all that God is doing, and we, we just, we're just expecting more of him. Amen, amen. But this week, we're in week two of our message series called Encounter. In our, this is week two, we're in the, the title of this message is All In, if you want to if you're taking notes, um, week two of the Encounter series is called All In. We've been talking about uh, um, people, individuals in the Bible who have had have encounters with God. And how it changed their life, how it marked their life forever. And as we read scripture, we often read scripture or we hear other people's testimonies. Or we hear about what, what God is doing in other people's lives. And we're so interested and we're so drawn to what God is doing. And it's so powerful what God is doing in other people's lives. But when we have an encounter of God, it it doesn't become, we're not listening to somebody else's story, but it, it becomes our story. And what we talked about last week is being discontent with hearing what's going on in other people's lives and God moving in other people's lives, but you want that to be the story of your life. God, move in my life. God, I want you to move in my life. I want to know you more. And here's the thought that we started with last week. We're going to start with it once again this week as we continue our message series of All In. It's this. We need God's power. More than persuasive words. We need God's power in our lives more than persuasive words. Paul was a skeptic. The Apostle Paul was a great man of God. God used him mightily to to further and advance the kingdom of God in this world. God used him as a missionary. God used him as an apostle to establish churches and and, and, and pioneer the the Christian faith in in Asia and in Europe and, and all around the Mediterranean. And God used him powerfully. But it wasn't always that way. Paul was a skeptic. Paul actually worked against the kingdom of God. But Paul had an encounter with Jesus Christ that changed his life forever. And that's how he shared Christ with others. In 1 Corinthians 2, 3 through 5, it says this, Paul talking to the Corinthians. I wish that you in weakness and fear, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. In my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul very well could have preached to the Corinthian church with, with much persuasive words. After all, Paul was, was very educated, and he was actually mentored by some of the, the greatest teachers of the Jewish faith. He was mentored by Gamaliel, who was one of the, the greatest scholars of the time. Paul said that he was a Pharisee of Pharisee. He, he, he kept the law right, right, to, the, right to, the very, to the very, every little dot, every T was crossed. He knew scripture, and he knew the Old Testament, and he could have very well preached very, very persuasive and, and educational messages to people so that their, their, their intellect was tickled, and they would, they would learn a lot about God. But, but he said, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I may. But may God's power be evident in everything that I do. May people have an encounter with God for themselves. May the Holy Spirit work in and through everything that I say, everything that I do. May people experience God for themselves. After all, he was a skeptic until he met Jesus face to face, until he had an encounter with a very real God one day standing right before Jesus. 
everything changed in that moment. For everything changed in that moment from becoming a becoming a murderer of a a, 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 a a someone who worked against the body of Christ, someone who 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 did everything they could to work against Jesus. He was radically against the Christian faith. He was radically against Christians. He'd, he'd pull them out of their homes. He'd, he'd pull them out of their towns, and he'd have them beaten. He'd have them murdered. He went from being radically against Christians to being a radical Christian. <laughs> he was once all out, and then he jumped in. He was all in. I believe that there's people here today, people here today. I believe that God is speaking to many of us and has been, been dealing with our hearts and maybe speaking to you even right now. And, he, and he's drawing you to a place where, where you're making that decision that well, God's speaking to you to go all in in your faith. All in. Not halfway, not part way. But all in. But let's read about the story of Paul. This is a, a, a portion of scripture that we're going to read, and we're going to get a good picture of what happened to Paul in his encounter with Jesus Christ. It was a life changing encounter. A man who worked against the church, murdered Christians, and it tells of his conversion, of how he had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and how it changed everything in his life. In fact, being the greatest enemy of the church, he turned to the greatest promoter of the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, he, he, in fact, he, read, he, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament here in the Bible that you read today. Now let's read it from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 25. Paul, um, he was, this is, his real name is Saul. It wasn't until he went to Cyprus where they began to call him Paul. Many people think at his conversion his name changed. It didn't. It's just that people start calling him a different name at a certain point. But when you hear the name Saul in the, in the, the New Testament, the book of Acts, these are actually talking about Paul, the apostle Paul. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue to Damascus. Here's the guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, breathing threats and planning on murdering Christians. In fact, he did. We read about Stephen in the New Testament, and Paul was there watching Stephen getting stoned, being martyred for his faith. And asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone who were of the way, the way was a name for for Christianity. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Some Christians are in the way, <laughs> keeping people from receiving Christ. <laughs> but we're in the way. <laughs> Whether men or women, he might bring them down to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground. That's often what happens when you experience the glory of God and the power of God is you fall to the ground. Why do people fall when they get prayed for sometimes? Because they can't stand. <laughs> That's all I can say. And heard the voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. This all happened after Jesus had died and was resurrected again. This is Jesus in his resurrected form appearing to Saul, to Paul. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city. And you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice 
but not seeing anyone. Imagine being part of that situation, and, then, and here's this guy who was killing Christians, and all of a sudden, he's on the ground. They're hearing this voice, but they're not really able to see what's going on. It must have been just, just, just dumbfounding, like, what's going on with this guy? Is he having a nervous breakdown? What's happening here? They stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground. When his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight. He neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, he said, Here I am, Lord. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight. Go to Straight Street (laughs) and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much harm has he done to your saints in Jerusalem? Saints means believers. Saints doesn't mean somebody you pray to. You're a saint. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. You are a saint. And there was, and there he, there he, and there he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, "For he is he is a chosen vessel of mine to hear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel." For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul, the apostle, went from being persecutor to persecuted. It wasn't God's form of revenge or punishment upon him. It was the price he was willing to pay to see this work he was trying to stomp out move forward. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying hands on him and said, Brother Saul, okay, he's a brother. They count him as a Christian now. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and received his sight at once. If that happened in our church service, we'd probably think that the person was, the the devil was involved with it or something. (laughs) Signs and wonders were common in the early church. Things that that we just did not understand, things that some miraculous things happened. And he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached to Christ in synagogues, and he is, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose? so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. Paul became a basket case. (laughs) For Jesus. Often what's stopping many of us from going all in with Jesus is what other people think. We often think that it's going to cost us too much and the price is too big. And how am I going to, how am I going to explain this to my family? What are, what are people going to say? They're all going to think that I'm crazy. Guess what? You're crazy anyway. It's all right. (laughs) 
Jesus' desire for every one of his followers, for every single believer in Jesus Christ, is for all of us to go all in to our relationship with him. Paul had this extraordinary encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus where he, where he experienced such a transformation by the power of God, by having an encounter with, with Jesus Christ that the, that the Jews were so confused about what happened to this man, what happened. This just doesn't make sense. This man who once killed Christians, who hated Christians, his life was changed, and now he's preaching in the synagogues about this man, Jesus Christ. What had happened to this man? What had happened to this man? This was the last person in the world that you would have expected for this transformation to happen. His life was changed. You cannot experience the presence. You cannot have an encounter with the living God without your life being changed. There is no going back. There's nothing to return to once you have experienced the sweetness and the power of the presence of Jesus Christ. And Paul tasted of that goodness. He he tasted of that glory. He tasted of that majesty. And his life was changed forever. He once killed Christians, and then he ended up being killed for being one. He tried to stop Christianity. He was turned to someone who spread Christianity like like wildfire. He planted churches. He trained leaders and pastors and elders to, to establish churches all around the world of that time. Have you ever seen someone that you never thought that they would get saved? <laughs> you thought maybe they were a hopeless case? Should I even bother praying for them? Should I bother telling them about the gospel? Should I bother, um, you know, expecting that someday they might get saved? That person at work, you know, they're, they're, man, they're, they're totally against Christianity. They're, they're totally, they're just, they're just a lost cause. Should I, should I share the, the gospel of Jesus Christ with them? Should I, should I be praying for them? Should I be, I be believing for their, for their salvation? Paul was that guy. Nobody you're working with is out there killing people, dragging people out of their homes, women, children, men. Paul thought he was doing God a favor. In, the, in his religious system, they, at the time, the, the sect that he belonged to, they, they, they thought that they were doing God a favor by trying to, to squelch this movement called Christianity. It wasn't a religious system that they were trying to stop. It was a movement of people who experienced Jesus Christ, who who their lives were changed. People who had experienced the resurrection of Jesus Christ and who were willing to lay down their life for that very fact. The resurrection of Jesus Christ changed everything. And that is the story of Easter. That's why we celebrate Easter. It changed everything. Every single one of the apostles, except for, the, except for John, they, they laid down their life for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was a truth that they're willing to lay down their life for. They saw it with their very eyes. I tell you what, if it wasn't true, they wouldn't be willing to lay down their life for it. One encounter with Jesus can change someone's life forever. And here was Paul. He lived his life all in. He lived his life for Christ all in. He he gave everything to Jesus. He gave everything to the gospel. He gave everything, all of himself, to the work and and to his relationship with God. He wasn't satisfied He wouldn't have been satisfied with what we call normal Christianity. See, God did not call you, did not call me to a normal life. He didn't call us to normal. He didn't call us to status quo. He didn't call us to what's going on in everybody else's life. God has called you. God has called me. God has called his sons and his daughters to a life of extraordinary, an extraordinary Christian life. Normal never changed the world. Normal has never done anything for anyone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
nothing. We're called not to a normal life, but to a supernatural life. Normal and average is a word that should be further from what should define what a Christian is. See, the world has seen enough average Christians. Average Christians do nothing to change the world. In fact, they do everything to and the, they do everything they can to blend in, to be just like everybody else. They hope they don't that other people don't find out that they're Christians. They try to blend in and look like everybody else. See, when the church began 2,000 years ago, after Jesus had died and resurrected and the, the church was established, normal was not the normal that we see today. Normal was extraordinary. That was the norm. The norm was extraordinary. It was not settling for status quo. It wasn't settling for what this person here is doing over here and that person here and all the people that are around me, what they're doing. The church of that day was extraordinary. That's why so many great works happened. They they pressed into God. They, They lived all in for Jesus Christ. And that's what God is calling us to today. He's calling us to an all-in relationship with Jesus because we're not satisfied for normal anymore. We're not satisfied for status quo. We're not satisfied for how we see everything else going. We want a relationship with God. We're going to move forward whether anybody comes with us or not because normal never changed anything. Normal never made a difference. But, Pastor, I just like it normal. I just like it just right. (laughs) I don't, why are you so intense? (laughs) What did the book of Revelation say? Jesus said it. I would rather that you're hot or cold. The lukewarm, what did he say? Vomit out of his mouth. Speaking to the church. God intended for us to be all in. You see, the secret to an extraordinary Christian life is this. You'll see it on the screen. The secret to an extraordinary Christian life is an intimate walk with Jesus Christ. The secret to an extraordinary Christian life is an intimate walk with Jesus Christ. The average Christian doesn't spend that much time reading their word. The average Christian barely makes time to pray. The average Christian shows up to church when they feel like it. Oh, pastor, you're stepping on my toes right now. But the secret to the extraordinary Christian life is an intimate walk with Jesus Christ. It's when we make him priority in every area of our life. When we spend that time in prayer, we are as strong as our daily walk with him. We are as strong as our daily walk is with him. The anointing is... An ability, it's a power, it's a blessing, it's a grace God puts upon our life to accomplish great things for the kingdom of God. The the Bible says that you have a holy anointing upon you. We receive the anointing when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the anointing increases. And the anointing comes when we spend time in prayer and time in intimacy with God. And that time empowers us to be all that God has called us to be, empowers us to be bold, to be his witnesses, to be be effective in this world that that we live in. It's a grace that comes upon us when we spend time with him 
to be empowered to be who he has called us to be. It, it empowers us not to move by our strength and do things on our own, but he comes alongside of us and he empowers us. He gives us words to say and gives us things to do. You see, being with Jesus does many things in our lives. It produces obedience. It produces action. And a real experience, a real encounter with him that's rooted in truth. And being with Jesus is contagious. And people around us, is gonna, people around us are just going to notice. They're going to notice that you've been around Jesus. The average Christian wants to shy away. The average Christian, average, okay, hopes no one notices. But when we've been with Jesus, people around us are going to notice. It says in Acts 13, 4, 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained. These are, these, are, these are normal people. You don't have to be just an educated person. You don't have to go to seminary or Bible school like pastors do. I don't care if you graduated the eighth grade. God will use you to do great and powerful things. Now, when they saw the boldness of, of Peter and John, Peter, a crazy fisherman who always had his foot in his mouth, never saying the right thing, always seeming to mess up until God got a hold of him. Perceive that they were uneducated, untrained men. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. If we're with Jesus, people will not help but to notice. And it's pretty clear that you'll become like the people that you hang around the most. You show me five people that you hang around the most, and I can tell you your future. And when you hang around Jesus, you're going to become more like him. When you spend time with Jesus, you're going to be like him. If you're hanging around people who are partying and going to the club, you're going to be like, you're going to turn into a person that parties and goes to the club. But when you hang around Jesus, you're going to become more like him. It's why we need to be careful of who our closest friends are. After a period of time, we'll become more like them. But when we choose Jesus, we're going to start becoming more and more and more like him. You see, there's a difference between knowing God, about knowing about God, and knowing God. And Paul, at one time, he, he knew a lot about God. But when he encountered Jesus, he knew him for himself. He knew him. He had a relationship with him. You see, talking about God does not make us extraordinary. Going to church and raising our hands and following all the rules and giving the offering, that is not what makes us extraordinary. Being with Jesus, spending time with the Savior is what makes us extraordinary. But there's an obstacle that keeps us oftentimes from entering into this extraordinary Christian life. Uh, this living into, entering into this, this Christian life where we decide to go all in for Jesus. A lot of times what it comes down to is we, we think to ourselves, well, what will other people think? Paul's peers thought he was crazy. All his fellow Scholars, they thought he was crazy. What, what's happened to Paul? What's happened to Saul? One time he had his act together. <laughs> he's gone, lost his mind. These same people he's try, he was trying to kill, he's become one of them. He's, become, he's like a traitor. He, he, he's crazy. He must have, so something must have happened to Saul. 
I'll tell you what, when I became a follower of Jesus Christ, there were some people that just didn't understand. Jeff, you've changed. Why won't you come do this with us anymore? How come you're like this now? How come you're going to church now? Why not hang out with us anymore? Some people aren't going to understand. It doesn't matter what other people think. His peers thought that he was crazy. And, and some of you might be thinking, Pastor, if I live the way you tell me to every week, I think people are going to think I'm crazy. Like I said before, they probably think you're crazy anyway. <laughs> so just go all in and prove them right. It's not going to change their opinion about you. People are more concerned about what other people think, but we've got to be more concerned about what God thinks. The apostles said when they were when they were, when they were up against the rulers, they said, this, would you rather us obey God or man? We will obey God. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter what other people, 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 other people say. But the, the only opinion that matters to me is the opinion of my Father. It's the opinion of God Almighty. It's the opinion of the one who died for me and rose again. The one who saved me of all of my sin. Your friends didn't die for your sins. Your friends didn't raise from the dead. Your friends don't provide for you. Your friends don't heal your body. Your friends did not give you eternal life. Jesus gave his life for us. Why can't we give our life for him? You see, we've got to get to a place where we're not offended. You know, so many people today are offended by so many things. It's ridiculous. They act like it puts them in a place of power. There's more power in learning to not be offended. The Bible says in the last days there will be great offense. People will take offense. A lot of people have taken offense. <laughs> Microaggressions. Political correctness. I believe in showing love and compassion towards people. But you know what? We as individuals need to not be offended. Don't be offended about what other people think of you. We've got to get to the point where we are oblivious to what other people's opinions are about us. And walk in the confidence and boldness of God. If you're concerned about what other people think of you, you'll never accomplish anything. You'll never do anything great for God if you will be so concerned about what they're going to say or what they're going to think. If you're going to be concerned about what other people think, you'll always be a follower. You'll never be a leader. And God has called every believer of Jesus Christ, every child of God, to be a, to be a leader in this generation. Amen. To stand up for righteousness. To bring the word of God with love and with boldness and in truth. But we become so concerned about what other people think. We get so entrapped in what the Bible calls the fear of man. I believe that there's people here today that, that God wants to deliver you from the fear of man in your life. It's an entrapment. It keeps you from being who God has called you to be. From saying what God has called you to say. From doing what God has called you to do. And let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name. We're not ending this service. But we're praying for that right now. Deliver your people from the fear of man in the name of Jesus. Fill them and baptize them with your spirit and give them the boldness to proclaim your gospel, to proclaim your glory in the name of Jesus. And may many great exploits be done through your people here in Jesus' name.
God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. Fear is not from God. Whatever's from, not from God, we do not have to accept. It's not ours. But what does the Bible say? God has not given us a spirit of fear. What has he given us? Power. Love. The Bible says love casts out all fear. A sound mind, a well-disciplined mind. We see things clearly. Fear wants to distort your view of reality. We've got to get to a place where we're not offended. We're oblivious to other people's opinions about ourselves. And where, where God's opinion is the only opinion that matters. The only opinion that counts. Your friends didn't save you. They didn't give you eternal life. They didn't die on a cross for you. He gave us. He gave his life for us. Let's give our life for him. You see, I heard someone say, people's, people's opinions are like armpits. Everyone has one. And some of them stink. We've got to make up our mind that we're going to go after God no matter what. We start caring more about what God thinks and what people think. And what other people think, that's when we'll really see God move in our lives. And for some of us here today, it's a, it's a matter of returning to our first love. It's, it, 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 it's returning to a, a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. It's, ma- it's making a decision to follow him, allowing him to transform our mind, transform our hearts. And following him wholeheartedly. In Revelation 2, 4, it says this. Jesus said it to the church. In fact, in these letters that Jesus wrote to the churches through the apostle John, Revelations 2 and Revelations 3, he was writing to the pastors of the church to share with their church. People say, well, these letters don't apply to us today. Yes, they do. And you will see parallels to these churches that Jesus writes letters to, to even the church today. And we'll be talking about it a little bit later on. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you and quickly, to you quickly, and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. That's not the gospel that you hear today being preached in a lot of churches. Married people, think about when you first fell in love with your spouse, with your husband or your wife. Remember that? <laughs> there was intensity about it, wasn't there? <laughs> you couldn't get your mind off of them. <laughs> you were at work and you were thinking about them. You couldn't wait to call them when you got home. You couldn't wait to go see them. All that mattered was spending time with this, this person that you were about to marry. It, 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 just, it seemed like your, your whole life was consumed with them. You, you couldn't spend enough time. Do you remember that? When she walked in the room, nobody else mattered but her. In fact, you weren't even aware that there was anybody else in the room. <laughs> you could smell her perfume, and you were just looking at her thinking she's the most beautiful woman in the world. Now she walks in the room, and you're like, uh-huh. And you click the remote, uh-huh. <laughs> and why do we do that? Because we left our first love. What happened? We need to return to our first love. We need to do the, the first works. Return to those days when we were, when, when, when we were just in, it had that intensity about each other. We were just, we're, we're, we're just so, so just, just couldn't wait to be around one another. That we wanted to spend time with one another. We, we did everything we could together. In Revelation 3, Jesus sends another letter to another church through John. It was the 
Laodicean church. So Laodicea actually means lukewarm. In this city, outside the city, they had a spring. It was a hot spring. Anybody been to the hot springs in Arkansas? I've been there. Hot springs come out of the come out of the ground, and they have these bathhouses where you can bathe in the hot springs. It's really wonderful. Um, but they had these hot springs in Laodicea, outside the city. And by the time it came into the city, the springs were lukewarm, and nobody really wanted to drink it. So they would go to water that was cold and refreshing. But if you read about the Laodicean church, it's much like the American church is today. And let me read this and see if it, if it strikes any chords with what we see in our country. Revelations 3, 14, 22. 14 through 22. And to the angel of the church, when they talk about the angel, it's really, the translation is really meaning the pastor, the messenger. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Whoa, Jesus. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me refi- gold refined in fire that you may be rich. In white, garment, in white garments that you may be clothed. And the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, he's talking to the church, he's not talking to unbelievers. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. This is real. It's not figuratively on his throne. It's real. As I also overcame and sat down by my father in his, on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Like I said, Laodicea was known for its hot springs that flowed from outside of the city into the city. When it came into the city, the water was lukewarm. I don't know about you, but I like to grab coffee in the morning. I like my coffee hot. I like it cold. I like hot coffee. I like iced coffee. Don't give me lukewarm coffee. I don't like iced coffee that got warm. I don't like hot coffee that got cold. (laughs) I understand what Jesus is saying. (laughs) So what's your temperature? What's your temperature? Say, well, I can't live like that all the time. How can you live on fire for God all the time? How can you live with that spiritual intensity all the time? Is that even possible? Yes. I remember getting saved, and I was just so on fire for God because of what he'd done in my life, delivering me and and changing me in such a way. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I was on fire for God. I remember some well-meaning, lukewarm Christians coming around me saying, you know, it's cool and everything, but you know what? Don't be disappointed when this wears off because it, you can't live like this all the time. I said, what are you talking about? I'm going to change who I hang out with. God's intention for us is to live on fire for him, to live under the fire of God in our life. We can walk in God's power. We can walk in God's in the, the passion and the fire of God every day of our life. He doesn't want us to live lukewarm. We've got to resist lukewarmness with everything that's within us. Because the, the, the devil wants us lukewarm. If we're lukewarm, he doesn't have to really bother with us. Right where he wants us. He's lulled us to sleep. Normal. Going back to that word normal. Not making a difference. 
we, there's a high price for lukewarmness. We see it in the life of our children. We see it in our own personal lives. We struggle spiritually. We struggle in so many areas of our life, but we're, we're so lulled to sleep that we just like almost become numb to it. And we believe this is just the way it's supposed to be. But God has, has called you and God has paid the price on the cross for you to live in his fullness. So those people came around me and they said, just, 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 it's not always going to be like this. Don't expect to live like this all the, all the time. I, I thought to myself, what has happened to you? As believers, we need to surround ourselves with other believers who are on fire for God. Other Christians, believe it or not, have more influence on us than sometimes people in the world. Jesus told us not to sit down and eat with certain kind of Christians, believe it or not. Those are some harsh words, but it was, it was, it was protecting our spirit. We trust so much with each other. We have so much trust in one another. That's why, that's why the Bible warns of, of a sexual immorality coming into the church. It becomes all right with one person, it starts to spread. Oh, they did it, it's okay. It's all right with them. I trust them. I urge you not to live a, a lukewarm Christian life. Lukewarm is one world in the kingdom and the other, one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. We give an hour, or hour and a half on a Sunday. We, we tip God in the offering. We, we sit on the sidelines. We exit those doors. We, we live life just the way that we want to live. And then we come back to church the next week, and then we expect the pastor to, to, to fix and to make up for everything that happened to me the week before in his message. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that you do not have to live a lukewarm life. But you can live in the, in the, in the fire of God, the, the, the passion of Jesus Christ in your life every single day. But pastor, what are the ingredients of living like this every day? What's, 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 what's the ingredients of receiving the fire of God on your life? It's hunger and thirst. It's your spiritual appetites. It's your spiritual appetites. Lord, I want more. Lord, I want everything you have for me. Lord, I don't want to go to heaven and finding out that there's more for me on the earth, that I missed out on something. Lord, I want more. Lord, I want to experience heaven now. I want to experience your glory. Lord, I want to have an encounter with you now. Lord, I want to experience your power and your presence now. Lord, I'm so hungry and I'm so desperate and I'm so thirsty for your presence. There's nothing that I want more than your presence, Lord. Like the psalmist says, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Lord, I want more. I want you. I want you in your fullness. I'm not, I'm not content anymore with normal Christianity. I'm not content with status quo. I'm not content with lukewarm. But Lord, I want to I want, I want to receive the fire of God on my life and, and live red hot on fire for Jesus Christ. Well, oh, Pastor, you're intense. God has so much more for you. God has so much more for you. We have the worship team come up. What's your temperature today? You see, no one's ever going to get to heaven and God tell them that you loved him too much. No one's going to get to heaven 
and God tell you that you served him too much. No one's going to get to heaven and God's going to say, hey, you gave too much or you, you took your relationship with, with me too seriously. No one's going to get to heaven and God say, well, you told too many people about me or you invited too many people to Church 180. Or you spent too much time in prayer. You read your Bible too much. You came to church too much. Will you go all in? Would you stand with me today? Let's lift up our hands and worship him. What I want you to do today... If you're here and you're hungering and thirsting, the Bible says for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sakes, they will be filled. You're here today and you're, you're hungering, you're thirsting for more of God in your life. You're saying today, Lord, I'm choosing to go all in. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter about their opinion. It, Lord, I, but, but the only opinion that matters today is yours. And today, as an act of surrender, I'm inviting you to come forward. Maybe you want to kneel around this altar. Maybe you want to lift up your hands and worship to him. But I'm inviting you right now to come. Come around this altar. Let's seek God. Let's come before him. Say, God, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. In fact, right now you're sitting in that seat and you're worried about the person next to you. Just, just, just step out of that fear and come. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're running in hope. Your presence. Lord, I want more. Lord, I want more. I want more, Lord. Let's worship him. Let's worship him. Let's worship him. With an intensity here today. Lord, we worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
We're not going to disrupt what's going on around the altar, but if you've got to leave to get your children, please go ahead. Feel, feel free to do that. For those who want to tarry around this altar, we just leave this open to what God is doing here. But be blessed. God bless you. Feel free to leave if you need to. Hallelujah. Maybe you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here and you are far from God. Maybe you're here and you are distant from Him right now. And today He's calling you to Him. Today He's saying, come, come, come experience my love. Come experience me. Jesus Christ himself died on that cross for you. He carried all of your sin. He carried all of your shame. And if you'll just trust in him and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I come to you. I come to you. I trust in what you did on the cross. And that three days later, you rose from the dead. Your life will be changed forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Why do people receive from God and others don't? Hunger. 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 If you're hungry, you'll absorb what he's doing in your life like a sponge, like a dry sponge. <laughs> Lord, increase our hunger. Increase our hunger, Lord. Increase our hunger. Father, we thank you for the move of your spirit in this place today. We thank you, Lord, for your power. We thank you for your anointing. We thank you for your word that does not return void, but it goes forth and accomplishes all that, Lord, you set out for it to accomplish. Lord, lives are changed. Hearts are changed. People's lives are saved. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Fill your people with your spirit. Fill your people with the fire of God. In Jesus' name, may we live lives on fire for you, Lord. Hot and on fire for you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, as we leave this place, may we leave this place knowing that your presence does not leave us, but it goes before us, it lives in us, and it's upon us. Lord, we go out here, Lord, just, just with the love and the power of God to